was he was the manager of the Portsmouth Mecca Bingo. Oh, oh he was a dude. Oh, only wore velvet. Hello and welcome to the Collecting Addicts podcast, episode number twenty-three. Hurrah! <laughs> now. I'd like to tell you some geographic locations. First of all, there is Neil Clifford, who is, I think, in Sicily. There is myself and Edward Lovett, who are in the United States of America. Manish, who is in the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And then there is Chris Cooper, who is sitting in an office somewhere. In London, boring. And he's not happy because he is the only adult in the room. (laughs) Um, Starting off today, who is your unsung motoring hero? I'd like to start with Manish Pandey, and you cannot say Ayrton Senna, because he is your sung hero. I thought about this, and um, it's very slightly connected to Senna, this story, but um, she, I think, is one of the most glorious people in Formula One that you may or may not have heard of. Um, I, uh, When we were doing all the Senna stuff, there were lots of stories that we could tell, But what was very painful about making something like Senna, it's all the stories you can't tell. And I got told the most incredible story by a British Airways stewardess about this woman. Um, When Senna was killed, uh, Williams was an absolute pandemonium. I mean, people really didn't have a clue what was going on, what was going to happen. We all knew it was Italy. Were bad things going to happen in the future? But in the absolute immediate aftermath, Someone had to anchor that team. Frank Williams, by all accounts, was absolutely distraught. Patrick Head was trying to work out what the hell had gone wrong. Um, David Brown was doing much the same thing. Damon was trying to glue something together in terms of, you know, being an anchor for the team. But the team was anchored by a woman called Anne Bradshaw. Yeah, I knew you to say her. Yeah. And she, for me, is the unsung hero of Formula One. Good I mean, choice. I love her. First of all, I just love her. She's always smiling. She's always, always organizing. And she's so much more than some kind of press person or team coordinator. She's one of these things that really makes, for me, Formula One, Formula One. And um, you get them. You get these people in all kinds of organizations. We had one in the NHS on the ward that I used to work for. We had one when I was a medical student who used to run a particular ward called Bond Street. And they're just people... They get it. They've been around a long, long time and they get it. And um, the reason why the story was so important is that Annie was not just looking after the whole of the Williams team at Imola, but I was told that um, after his funeral, she was the person who shepherded the team again, got them onto the plane, got them off the plane, got them back to Grove as it was at the time and, um, and said, look, you know, to the guys, we can't stop. We got to go on. So she, for me, Annie Bradshaw, if you're listening to this, no, oh, you are the best. Wow. wow, what a fantastic way to start this show! And I tell you what, I don't fancy following that. So Neil Clifford, I'm going to hand it over to you as the ultimate hospital pass. Oh dear, thank you very much. <laughs> well, he's maybe he's not an unsung hero. He's an unsung hero of mine. Is Alan Clark? Alan Clark, who was a Tory MP in the 80s and the 90s wrote the only book I've read more than once, the only book that sits beside my bed, the only book that my wife says, why do you keep reading that fucking book? Because it's the only book you like. Um, Backfire. If you haven't bought it, please go and buy it. Everyone should own a copy of Backfire if they enjoy this podcast. This was a man who adored his cars, had a name for every car, um, and did huge drives, two CVs to Zermatt, the original Discovery up to the Highlands of Scotland. He customised a Beetle with a 356 engine and disc brakes. The, the, actually, it was a very understated car that he loved racing people, and they had no idea what it was. He had two Chevrolet Impalas. Of course, one always needs two Chevrolet Impalas. The winter <laughs> car, the and coupe, the car. and the summer car. He adored American cars, actually. Plenty of Bentleys, massive of writing about Bentleys, C-types, D-types. Um, I think he owned a lot of the D-types at One Le Mans. Loads of Jags. Um, sorry, Jags. Um, loads of blower Bentleys. Just an absolute dude. Drove everywhere, wrote brilliantly. Not only wrote about cars and 
think he was a he's a, a writer for sports car and classic car whatever it's called for years and years and years robert croucher um, dear robert was his uh, i think wrote the forward for backfire but he also kept a beautiful diary and again uh, i thoroughly enjoy his diary not only is it about cars but it's about his animals about his anxiety about his hypochondria all the shit that we've all got and he's just an adorable man so underneath the sort of the shell of maybe being a bit of a thatcher tory mp which you know is a bit marmite for a lot of people he was just a beautiful man and i would urge everyone to go and buy backfire Neil, okay because obviously as, as a fellow as a fellow obsessive of of alan clark and i read the diaries most days yeah how do you, like, like me how do you square the fact that he had some very questionable views on certain things and and he was a bit of a wrong one as well um in terms of the way he you know handled his marital situation i i, I my version is i just I don't want to be his friend. I just loved his output and I love the way he wrote. There's a phrasing and a tone of voice that I just... He, he was, a, I mean, I he wrote a lot of books as well about the war that I can't remember all of them. I'm sure you guys will remember the names of a lot of his books. The Donkeys. Being, the Donkeys. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was a, he's a brilliant author. And maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lover of human beings, so I would find the good in him. Yeah. Neil, 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 do you remember the passage? There's just one thing. I mean, I remember it's one of those books, his diaries, not Batfire, but his diaries. You do not want to be reading that on a train or a tube because when you start laughing, oh. I mean, you absolutely wait yourself. There's just this brilliant bit where he writes about sitting right behind Thatcher in the Houses of Parliament. And he said, I sat behind her today. And he always had a capital H when he described it. It was great. Yeah, he had a bit of a, I was going to say, a bit of a soft spot. lady. Oh, he the did. lady. And, he says her, yeah. and, her, and her hair looked perfect. No, he, he adored her. Perfect. And, you know, we, we can't do politics or religion, but he did he did adore her. But he and was just so funny about her. So funny about her. He was an early vegetarian as well. I mean, yep. I think, yep. not, not to say I'm a vegetarian, but I think uh, probably the world would be slightly better place if we were all vegetarians. There's a bit of a sort of anarchistic thing to say, but I always remember thinking, wow, that's, you know, you wouldn't have imagined him to have been a very vegetarian. He used to write pages and pages about his blackbirds yep. and we'd be distraught if one broke, you know, their foot in the garden and he'd make cakes for them and feed them and worms and so just a fabulous guy. But it's all for me, it was all about the cars, really. His his brilliant words about the long, long journeys driving back from I think he was the MP for Plymouth. And yeah. he would drive back to his castle, of course. You know, Deal you in Kent. Yeah. You, you have a castle in Kent at an Saltwood. average of Saltwood. At, yeah, Saltwood. Um at an average of 94 miles per hour, and he'd write it in or, you know, up to sort of 127 miles per hour and on, on the M3 at two o'clock in the morning. And those are those are things that we all, as we talked about last week, we just adore those long journeys at night. And he did a lot of them. And I think did, you know, drove the Swiss Alps and his Rolls Royce Silver Ghost many times. Just a just a top car dude that is that is should be more popular. So our people. Uh, I um I totally endorse it, and I'm sure we'll get some people that totally disagree with us. But I, I his output is fantastic, and his tasting cars, absolutely the best. Yeah. And he was um, very very entertaining in the witness box at the Matrix Churchill trial. Matrix Churchill, yes, <laughs> that was. Uh, and he coined that phrase from Robert Armstrong, who was the cabinet secretary who got sent to Australia to defend the government in the very spy good. catcher trial in the mid eighties, and he sort of. That I was a bit economical with the actuality, which I thought was a. But th this was a man. That, then, yeah. That when he passed away, which was very very sad, he had a he, he was the only owner of his XK one twenty bought it new, I think, in fifty two fifty three. First and, owner. And 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 just owned it all his life and raced it everywhere. A lovely white um, with spats XK one twenty. What's, and also what he said about Hesseltine, the type of man who buys his own furniture. Poor chap, he had to buy his own furniture. <laughs> yeah, that was the best <laughs> put down of Hezza you could ever hear. And yeah. he didn't inherit a castle bit. full of it, yeah. And he referred to Ken Clark as a pudgy heart attack wrist, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he had some good put downs, I'll give him that. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, I, uh, I think we'll move on now to Chris Cooper. So I like, I kind of like both of those. Annie Bradshaw is... She is a force of nature. And one of the things she's been doing most recently was acting as PR comms general encourager of the W series, which uh, this week we saw very sadly gone into administration, which I, I have a person, uh, Catherine Bonmuir, who's the 
was the CEO of that fellow board member of mine at Motorsport UK, they all worked incredibly hard to move the dial on women in our sport. And Annie was a fantastic ambassador and flag waver for that as well. So, um, so I kind of gone for a driver. And he's a very, he's a, I think he's almost unique. He, um, so I mentioned this before, some of you will have seen the Road to Le Mans series that's on YouTube. It's a Porsche series. It's been released on YouTube. Four or five years they've been doing it now. And it's basically about Michael Fassbender, the Irish German actor, whose lifelong passion has always been motor racing. And quite a few years ago, you would see him occasionally in Port, in Ferrari Challenge type stuff and so forth. But he clearly wants to go to Le Mans and he's a big Porsche fan. So Porsche created this series based, based around him, going through everything from doing you know Porsche track days and then Porsche Cup and doing European Le Mans series. And finally, last year to the 22 Le Mans series, getting to Le Mans 20 race. And Michael raced again this year. And I think we talked about it briefly last week, had a really unfortunate shunt in the Porsche curves and, and that was it. Um, it was done by Porsche. It's, it's actually, and it's beautifully made. It's really nice. And, and even if you know the answer and what's going to happen, it's still really worth watching. It's not some Porsche fluffy pit. It's quite raw um, because Fassbender does not have an easy time. Um, and part of the journey is seeing how challenging Michael clearly finds it. And particularly last year when they first went to Le Mans, how difficult and the realization almost actually, can I do this? Should I be here? Am I up to it? Um, but the guy who I think is an unsung hero, even though many of us in the sport know him, is Richard Leeds. So Richard Leeds, I think, is still a Porsche factory driver. I think longest, the, I think longest serving. Yeah, probably longest, definitely longest serving. So we would have seen him racing at the at Nurburgring in the Manti Grello before everybody called it a Grello. Mm -hmm. um, quite a game about more than 10 years now. Um, he's super quick super quick i mean and he's so utterly reliable you bolt him in and that's as fast as a car will go he doesn't make mistakes um he's clearly utterly professional he's devoted to the cause of porsche and everything they want to do but the reason why he's my unsung hero is what i saw and learned about him in that road to Le Mans series with fassbender there are lots of professional drivers we all know who we could all name Take us down a pub one day and we'll tell you a few names where when they're faced with either a celebrity or somebody who's clearly struggling to get remotely near their professional will be sort of unkind or not at least not very helpful um, and kind of see it not as their problem. But Richard Leitz was an heroic human being to me in how he helped and supported Michael, never made him feel bad, was always there for him, always encouraging him. And even when Fassbender had a few shunts, and before Monkey says it, I know what it feels like to have a few shunts. Yeah, I do know how it feels like a few shunts. Um, and Richard was never judgmental, was always trying to just unpack what had happened, what to do, walk on, do the next thing. So he, so he learned and, everything from me, because I was there for you in <laughs> those moments when you were picking guardrail out of your teeth. I must have been, I must have missed that moment. Must have missed anyway, but yeah, that's the idea of it. That's the idea of it. And and thinking back now, actually, how much I would have appreciated that monkey from the younger states. Ooh. How um, I tell you what, wash your mouth out with soap and water. I was always there for you when you, you were back were. in the motorhome. You were. I tease it. You know. You would, know. I. You know. And we I would. That. And we'd be you looking at I the know. video footage, and I'd be going, "Mister C, you were going so well until oh, yeah, yeah. that that stuff just. That's goes the way it works. When you're sitting with your mate, you were and you were going yeah, yeah. so well. <laughs> Yeah, I must have said that to you as well. Yeah, and, and, and in all seriousness, and I would say, you know, you know, I love you and respect you and, and do anything for you. Monkey is very good. And the th one of the things I think you are very good at is you literally, apart from when you were told to just bring it home and you didn't, you always brought it home. But, I mean, massive reliable. You know, anybody looking for a younger professional driver than me, Monkey's a good hire because he just always brings it home. Richard Leeds was one of those characters. So... He was, he doesn't, he's not really on social media. No. He's, he, he doesn't, he's not affected. The stuff you do to him, he's just doing stuff that we do. He's got some resto mod Toyota Starlet rally car he's been building, which is just the coolest, amazing thing. So also, his car, control, his, his car control on the loose. Oh. You'll find some videos of him driving things like Mark IIs and BMW M3s. Yeah. 
Yeah. On, does it, does it Good pick, does, God, he can drive. He can drive. The stuff that he was he showed, he was driving a early 911 through somebody's vineyard somewhere. And oh, you try and find that's on Instagram. It's just, it's poetry. So uh, for a professional driver who is a member of the human race, a consummate team player and supporter of somebody who it would be quite easy for lots of people to get frustrated with in, in Fassbender. Um, for me, Richard Leeds is totally an unsung hero. I love him. Great shout. Great shout. Now, Edward. You can go next. No, I, I'm going to ask you to go next. But just, just so that you know the rules of the game, it can't be you. You've got, you've got, to, nominate, you've got to nominate someone else. OK. But, well, I, can I change my own? <laughs> nominate Chris. <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have heroes. Um, but he, he doesn't. He's, not, otherwise. He, he's I, not lying. He doesn't. I don't have heroes. However, I have I have many influences. Influences, <laughs> influences, influences, right, I'm influences. Off. you. And I want to give this one to the fellow addicts out there. And Chris and I are in a hugely privileged position to be where we currently are with the epitome of what we stand for in being the addicts who want nothing back from us, but want to share their absolute passion with friends and colleagues around them. And to see it here over the last 48 hours is truly astonishing. And, to, you know, to, and, and we're, we're not just talking about you know, older people, you know, a, a wide age range of people who are totally addicted to the motor car um, and, and share it with such generosity, with such depth of knowledge. Um, it's just wonderful to see it. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm giving this one to all of the fellow addicts out there who mm -hmm. share, their, share their passion and and want nothing back from it. That's yeah. lovely. I really like that. I think uh, I think it's amazing that in the, in the last week I've had someone um, encourage me to drive their E46 three series touring that had done about 150,000 miles just because they wanted me to be reminded of how great a car it was. And yesterday I had someone invite me to drive their uh, rough yellow bird original, one of my ultimate cars because he just wanted to let me drive it. I just love that. I love the fact there's the full spectrum. That basically, mm. if, you've got, if you've got the bug and you're part of the community, it doesn't matter how much money you've got, you want the other person to, to sample what makes you tick. Um, so Edward's definitely right. Um, I, there, I, I have got one hero, though, and uh, who's the guy who uh, recovered me off the circuit yesterday after spinning the M1 Pro car. <laughs> <laughs> He was doing so well until that point as Good well. Good work, yeah, so well. <laughs> me. Don't know, wait, I'm not going to let him tell the story because uh, he was driving along and his ditch jumped out in front of him. And then there was a, a it wasn't I that. Know, it wasn't that. Know. But, uh, he was, uh, that and so many times when that guardrail leaps out and hits you in the face. Right. Yeah. So my, my my I do have heroes. I have far too many heroes and and heroines. Am I one of them? No. Uh, and um, really not. Uh, and, and I I think. But I, I tend the obvious ones, maybe they're just they're too present the whole time. What I find is I, I happen across people in my life who affect me in a very short period of time because I admire what they've done or I just I love the way they can control a room. And I and I might never see them again, but I just I find them captivating. And I, I've got a list of those. And the most recent one actually is the guy called PG Anderson, who co-drives for me on a rally in Sweden, you're gonna see a video of this very soon. He won the Junior World Championship when there was such a thing, which was just below WRC, two years on the trot. And he's just someone who, I just loved his philosophy of life. He got in the car, I'd never met him before, and he just encouraged me to drive as fast as I dared. He didn't know me from Adam. And he made me laugh, and, he, and then he'd say profound things, then he'd say stupid things, then he'd say facile things. It was the full spectrum. I think many people that have rallied will understand that you build a bond with a co-driver in a way that you don't in any other form of sport because you're basically driving on this person's eyes and their instincts and their experiences. Mm. So I'd say 
most of the unsung heroes I've met are probably rally co-drivers. And that goes out to Bryn Moore Pierce, who, who co-drives for me as well. Because these are the people that you spend three hours between stages talking to about your children, talking in a way I don't talk to anyone, really. Um, and then I, I'll do one that's a bit icky as well, because he won't like me saying this, but um, because he's a very good mate of mine, and I count him as one of my best friends. But for the way that he can run a business and the way that he can drive a car, mainly, and, and for also for the way he keeps me on the rails, because I'm not easy to manage, Richard Tuttle, who is... Um, He's just a, he's a legend of a bloke. Anyone that knows him, you might Love find him. Icky. I mention his name the whole time. But if you sit in a 911 on the loose with him when he's got his tail up and he wants to go quick, I don't think there's many better things that you'll experience. It's it's out of body in, in, in it, the way that the vehicle's controlled and what it can do. So there you go, Rich. That'll make you feel embarrassed and sicky, but I had to do it once. And I'll I'll go back to calling you a prick tomorrow. <laughs> um, I think uh, I think should we move straight on to cue cars now? I'm going to go straight on to cue cars because I think um, we we might we might get a bit tight on time. And also, I think the cue car conversation is really interesting. I'm going to pass over to my learned Wikipedia in a minute, Mr. Cooper of the Large Foreheads, um, so he can tell us exactly about the etymology of cue car and where it comes from. But let me just tell you why I think they're important. I think anyone that loves motor cars, loves the idea of, of that iron fist in a velvet glove, you know, talk quietly, carry a big stick. I don't know how many cliche phrases there are for it, but the idea of not displaying the length of one's <clears throat> uh, and just quietly going about your business is, the, is for me at the heart of car enthusiasm. Uh, and I think we all love stuff that's just, just below the radar. So Chris Cooper, over to you to tell us why they're called cue cars what you think about them, and nominate one. You have to nominate Just one. the one. Just the one. Well, it's all about submarines. It's all about submarines. So yeah. um, submarines were a late 19th century invention, and the first sort of commercially technically viable one, which is basically diesel electric, you know, these submarines go under the water, so you can't run an internal combustion engine because, well, you just can't. You run out of air. So you've got to have an electric battery under the water, diesel engine on the surface to charge a battery. So the Holland, most many of you heard about Holland. He was an Irish American. I may have got that wrong. Correct me in the comments if you, if you can. Um, he designed the first submarine that was basically. So why why is it about submarines? Because um, quite quickly and obviously they became used in warfare, and it was regarded as very very poor form in warfare, particularly in First World War and before that, to say, to shoot com um, private or commercial non-passenger carrying services. So the protocol was, this is how warfare used to operate, was if you saw a surface ship, so if you saw a, a, a merchant ship, you had to say, um, would you like to abandon your ship or hand it over to me or else I'm going to sink you? And there'd be a bit of a dialogue goes back and forwards. Submarines sort of changed that. So submarines originally said, well, we're here, we're going to torpedo unless you sort of hand us over. Um, but very quickly in World War I, it became clear that submarine commanders were not doing that and were basically just torpedoing merchant ships. So the Q ship emerged and the Q ship was a merchant ship that was heavily armed. So in other words, it looked like a merchant ship, but carried, it was packing heat, lots of it. And the Q bit of the Q ship was because, I mean, there's a number of different stories and theories on this, but the one I sort of like most is that Queenstown, Southern Irish coast, was a port where many of these merchant ships were modified, hence Queenstown ship, hence Q ship. And the Q ship idea was, well, and this is a bit that's actually quite sneaky, and actually well, I'm not quite sure that the Q ship and Q car are the same. I like the speak softly and carry a big stick. Theodore Roosevelt was credited with that. But the Q ship was intentionally designed to entice and entrap a submarine or a U-boat and then unleash hell on it because they thought they weren't expecting it. So the Q ship was sort of a bit of a dastardly sort of idea and an origin. But the link between that and Q car is sort of fairly well. So Q ship, Q car, speak softly, carry big stick. That's where it comes from. And I love them. I love the idea of a cue car. And it's sort of, we had this debate on our little chat. Can I just stop you there, by the way? Does anyone else in this room now want us to have another video series called Chris Cooper Explains? <laughs> Potentially. Might just, just <laughs> me then. 
You're, just you're, 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 a, you're a great loss to the teaching oh, profession. It was just yeah. beautiful. Carry on. I'm going to okay, shut up. Fine. Just love anyway, Sorry. So, um, there are some, you know, we all know there's people who debadge the base model car of a range. I would always debadge. Get, get what's coming. Sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah. We're go. Come back to it. Actually, hold on two seconds. Uh, We're hold on. To, um, come in, James. Come in, come in. Right, we've got we, we, we've got to go. We're going to we, do... we're going to we're going to pause cue cars and we're going to quickly do a two car garage. Okay, because we've got we've got Chris Gilbin here who developed all of the modern McLaren road cars, oh. uh, and we've got we've got someone who's also quite well known in Formula One because he designs quite good Formula One cars as well. He might have won a few races. Right. So and we, we've we've we've, we've, better sit down. we've told them we've told them <laughs> what we've told them that there he is, Mr. Newey. We've told right. them we've told we've told them what the, what the question is this week. Okay, I'll read it out quickly for you. Okay. I'm going to read it out very quickly for you. <laughs> yeah, I love this. This is what I call organised podcasting. <laughs> you have amazingly inherited £250,000 from a long-lost uncle who kept his 2008 lottery win completely secret from the whole family. He wrote <laughs> in his will, you have to go and enjoy yourself for once in your life. One day, you'll be dead like me. Um, don't, be not, don't be a normal boring self. Pay off your mortgage. Go and buy two cars you always talked about, the ones you've always dreamt about as a, as a child. For God's sake, forget practicality and logic this time. I must insist you go on plenty of unplanned late night drives across the country. You were for sure my most boring nephew, but you have a strong work ethic. And therefore, for some reason, weird reason, I liked you the best. Kindest regards, Reg. Um, and that comes from Neil Clifford. It's quite heartfelt. Um, you two, what are you going to spend your 250 on? You might you need to speak to. reasonably, not, not to. Yeah, you'll get it. Yeah, yeah, so, Adrian Newey, 250 grand, two cars. All right. So, I think one of them's got to be a Hooning car. Yes, it? yes. So, I would say actually, when we were driving in this morning, there's a black Pontiac, um, which was the Vanishing Point car. It's and, gorgeous. And yeah. that's, the Vanishing mm -hmm. Point was, you know, I was about 12 when that film came out. I remember going to the cinema. And there's a scene in it where, um, with my parents, and there's a scene in it where they're going alongside with a beaten up old E-type, so like kind of doing all this business. And then the uh, the vanishing point guy shifts up and I and goes, wait. I remember <laughs> shouting at the top of my voice, he's gone on again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got to get one of those, but fully tweaked up. You yeah. Know, spend a bit of money on getting the big engine and all the rest of it, the, the wide tires. Yeah. So that's got to be one of them. Um, again, American, but I think undervalued, actually, because then you want an open car as well. I think, yeah. So, yeah. Sunny yeah. Uh, so actually a Chevy C1 with the, the single headlight one. Yeah. From, what was that, late 50s, something like that? Yeah. That's a good car. Ah, crikey. We've got a VW. That's it. You've only got two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it. VW can't. He's still got about two. Yeah, but he, left. he's still got 150 grand left. <laughs> All right, okay. That's All right, right level. The trouble is, there's, there's there's that sort of gap, isn't there? Because like buying a modern Ferrari is a piece or something. I don't know why they cost, but everybody's got them. I know. Oh. Also, how are they to drive cross country on your own at night? Yeah. So. Oh, crikey, there's that middle ground of sort of okay. So you spend. 60 on the Pontiac. Yeah. So that leaves you kind of 200 ish. What do you spend that on? That's quite a difficult. It is. Area. It is. Well, I mean, I've got my answer. Good. But what are you going to have? Yeah. Well, so, but he, this is, this bloke's so arch. Whilst he was developing, you might have heard the podcast I did with him two years ago. He spent yeah. his life developing fast McLarens and he drove around in a bloody Defender. So what are you going to have? Yeah. Good call. <laughs> right. Okay. So I listened to this podcast, actually. Uh, they all say that. And I listen to it while I'm out running and it's a lovely tempo. So my pace has slowed down a bit, but I'm, I'm paying attention to what you all do. Is he leaving soon? So, <laughs> so none of you ever answer the question. So that, that's what I'm going to do now. So, um, so two car garage yeah. with a budget. Yeah. Right. So uh, first of all, I'm just going to put 10 grand in a, an account to spend on Ubers to get me to the airport. Yeah. And um, some flights. That's very practical. It is yeah. very practical. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and the, uh, maybe a bit more than that. So, some flights, some flight tokens oh, as well. I don't think that's in the spirit. These uh, guys never, never do the rules. So, you, so I've been doing, doing Formula One. That's I, what you do with your life. <laughs> this not always bend the rules. So, I've done my research. Yeah. And then the rest yeah. of it is I'm going to take 
people out for dinner, like our friend that's invited us to this lovely track here in Chicago, yeah. Mouse Motors Track Day. And I'm going to keep buying them nice bottles of wine and dinners and be yeah. their best friend so that I keep getting invited to then drive all <laughs> of these amazing cars. <laughs> so I've got five Formula One cars here, six uh, Group C cars, the umpteen Can Am cars, and that's the way we're going to do it. That is one. so sly. That is yeah. that's a sly. Oh, okay. I learned it from the best. <laughs> we lot. So yeah. there we are. Spot, so spot, sly. spot the people that work in motorsport. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, it's, it, but it's not. It's it's not. It's they're not wrong either. Yeah. Them it has to be said. They're not wrong. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just about to go off and drive one of my Golf McLaren F1 GTR. Uh, Adrian, what are you going to drive? I'm going to drive the MP413, which is my first McLaren. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, happy and have a nice day. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen. Nice Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, so yeah, that was that was that was uh, a reasonable cameo. I'm sorry we had to interrupt Chris Cooper and his cue cars, uh, but <laughs> no, you know, much need, sometimes needs must. Right, needs back. Must. See, uh, this podcast really is quite bizarre sometimes. Yeah. Let's put our microphone back. Chris, you told us about how Q yeah. came to be. Uh, yeah. And also, I do think the one thing I, I, the point that you made that I, I actually believe you didn't need to make is that I think part of Q is luring people into yeah, thinking yeah. No, I, get, I, get I think that. that's part I of the joy that. of Q cars. Yeah, and now carry on. What, what are well, your choices? And, and, that's, wh and that's why um, I always, as far as is possible, I always debadge my cars. Um, even the really, really super duper powerful ones, there's something really nice about debadging them because you never quite know. So yeah. if I had to pick one, if I had to pick one, it's a tough one. Merc 500E. Oh! oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Manage his face! Manage his face! I've got, I've got another eight. But <laughs> I'm playing by the choose, can, we, can you choose another eight and then <laughs> and then we're gonna forget you said that and then Manish is gonna pretend I'll come back to say okay. five hundred E like no one's heard it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, Manish. <laughs> no. Uh, Chris, give us another one. Um BMW five fifty diesel. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. the ultimate, ultimate Q car. He's going for three. Alpha 164 Pro Car. Yes. That V10 engine in it. That's yeah. bloody cool. Yeah. No, uh, uh, so I, I think uh, yeah. I think I think because I think Manish just needs to let his heart rate relax a bit. I'm gonna no, I'm gonna first, dip him though. for this one. I'm gonna go straight to Neil Clifford. Can I do Neil's before him? Because I, I I think I know what's gonna choose. No, I want to give Neil Clifford <laughs> the chance to speak. I, I want to give Neil Clifford the chance to speak before you ruin it, Edward. Come on. It's my favorite type of car, this I've decided. Actually, yeah. I've owned all of them, and and I'll come to my favourite one in a minute. But the, you know, the the am I, am I allowed to name them, or I'm not really allowed to sort of talk about them all. But or, I mean, it comes from Germany, does it? Even though it was about Germany trying to sink our boats, the best Q cars probably are German because yeah. yeah. it's part of their culture to probably be quite understated and you can yeah. do 200 miles an hour and you take your badge off and you're some industrialist that owns the factory your grandfather created and you're the world leader in making sewing machines and or whatever you are or, or knitting fucking needles and you drive up and down the motorway 170 miles an hour in your Mercedes that no one, you don't want anyone to know how wealthy you are. I think that's a sort of, it sort of comes from Germany, does it? Brabus, Alpina. It's a, it's a German thing. I think they have to have four doors. Is that a given? Even yeah, I think now you, I think oh, now you say it. Yeah, I don't think there's any hard and fast rules, but I think you're right. I think you're right. I think it needs to be something that might carry a family. I think it's got to have four doors, even though I've, you know, I've had a couple of SL60s, which I know, Chris, you're a little bit pissy about the, the R129 SL60. But I, I think that's a, that's a Q car, but somehow that's not doesn't quite get in the in the in the league because of it's a coupe but my favorite actually my favorite is a car i've recently bought which is a jaguar project eight which i know ed you're you're thinking i was going to name something else no i haven't i've just written it up just there. Written Pro Pro project eight <laughs> so, so you've named a great car and you've stitched love it which i, I mean two birds no, that's not my win. So i knew that's what he was going to say I've done a, it was just a mind trick it was a mind sandwich trick. of loveliness 
but I think the, the the project A, I was super lucky to be offered this car. It was a God knows why the guy bought it. He's obviously got too powerful of sort of left brain or whatever. But it's a it's a Brewster Green made to order bespoke project eight without the spoiler and no yeah, stickers. Definitely and no spoiler. I took it to Lamore last week. It's probably the last good Jaguar that's ever going to be built. It's the fastest Jaguar that's probably ever been built. It's super understated. I can drive into London and not look like a dick, which you do in a Ferrari or a Porsche or whatever. No one knows what it is. And it goes almost 200 miles an hour and it's bloody fantastic. So I think that would be my choice. But there's a million choices. There's a million. The interior of that car you sent us. It's really good. No, it's really good. And I'm, I, I'm, I, I'm desperately struggling not to name all the ones that I love, but I, I will name the Mercedes 6.3. That to me is a yeah. is a. Is hey, I'm a, cheating. You set them. No, you I said it was look, one it's a, car. It's a, gen- it's, a, them all. it's a general you know, discussion. Neil Clifford should be allowed to speak you because that, that, like that's 6.3. I, I own the one of one car as an estate, which is just bloody awesome. Um, and it was made in a sort of garage in secret around the back of Stuttgart by the the, the head of. Um, whatever he was in he didn't even tell the board until it was, was he the head of q <laughs> well he, he probably was yeah you know he stuck a sick he stuck the, the 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 mercedes 600 engine and suspension and gearbox into a normal saloon car and yeah. so i think the germans are the king of q that was ulan that did that wasn't it yeah it was it was yeah and they're my favorite type of car for sure I think I, I, I agree with everything you've said, but I'm going to say something controversial. Yes. I think one of the things that, for me, that gives you Q status is that almost anyone, even in their, even with knowledge, won't spot it. Yeah. And I think a Project 8 is one of the punchiest looking things I've ever seen on the road. I can spot that car a mile off because of its I ride, because right, of its speaking, width. It's not many people can. Loudly, more loudly. Yeah, but you think most people don't spot it, and you'll no, know this I've, because I've, you're, you I've drive it. it. I've dailyed it for the last three weeks uh, into into areas of London where, frankly, cars aren't really liked at all, and it doesn't get spotted as long as you don't, you know, go over four thousand revs. So it sort of is really bloody yeah. noisy. The don't other thing it. I'd say about Q, then I'll shut up because I can take over the whole podcast on Q. Is Bristol as a mark? is a mark that was all about Q, be it there weren't many four-door ones. It was all about understated velvet glove. It was the original hybrid in a way, very chic, understated body with a massive bloody engine that no one... And even now you drive a Bristol around London, no one knows what it is, thinks it's, you know, it is an old banger, frankly. And and there is, there's a strong argument for that steel hand velvet glove. One of the things I read last night when I was researching this, uh, Roosevelt claimed that his speak softly and carry a big stick philosophy was one of the reasons why I think he said he spent seven and a half years of his eight year presidency. This is the turn of the last century, uh, early 20th century. He said they achieved all of their foreign policy objectives without a shot being fired. I think yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So yeah, it, you guys yeah, are great. That is the other, the other tiny, shut, shut up then, the other tiny little bit on cue. I suppose it's Mercedes Black Series. I know it's not quite Q, but I've got a fabulous mate called Thomas who runs um, Horsepower Hunters Instagram. Young guy, again, all these beautiful young guys, got amazing cars. A CLK Black Series. No one really knows what that is. The first yeah, one. Yeah, that one works. Having, having owned one, I have to disagree. I used to park it in Bristol and there'd be 10 people taking photos of it when I came no, that's back. that's Chris Harris. Yeah. No, it wasn't. I wasn't even there. <laughs> um, right. I, I think uh, we're going to move on to Manish now. And could you just surprise us with your choice of car, please, Manish? <laughs> that's the E500. Sorry. I've got to tell you the story, though. The story, the, the, the story behind this is great. I was invited to a good friend of mine, Finally got married in 2001, quite a shishi wedding in um, New York. He was a banker and um, one of that, they had various functions over a week, but one of them was possibly the wankiest lunch I've ever been to. Literally at my table were just a bunch of irritatingly successful corporate financiers and traders. And mm-hmm. the only line I can remember from this lunch was one of them really drunkenly saying to the other one, where's your bonus, schmuck? <laughs> like that, I mean, that was the line. So um, there was a guy, though, on the table that just didn't fit in. And um, 
he seemed to be about as uncomfortable as I was all the way through this lunch. And at some point, he looked at me and just did that, that <laughs> tongue in his cheek and started doing this. <laughs> I couldn't mean two things, that. <laughs> I've been to lunches like that. <laughs> he literally, no, so, so, so he, he sort of said to me, are you as bored as I am? And I said, I am. Yeah, it's one of those lunches. Well, he just said, Look, you want to go to the city? I know a great bar. Let's just go and hang out. We'll have to do another one of these things for a bit. So he and I left and there was an E500. He had a black E500. And oh, we oh. drove 1994, the yeah. car. He had it new in 94. So we got into the car and um, it was just crappy, classic. We were going from Oyster Bay into Manhattan. and. Uh, Traffic was start, stop, start, stop. So you never really got a sense of this. But I remember just seeing the car for the first time and going, ah, oh, E-Class Mercedes. And then just looking again and noticing everything about this car was different. And when he turned the ignition on, I thought, what are we in? And then I realized this guy's nuts about cars. And he and I, we became amazing friends. I mean, to the point where um, he he's ethnically different to me. He's a different religion to me. He has a very different social background and um but we really are soulmates it turns out we love tintin we love really similar wines god we <laughs> love the same sort of food he could never get married this guy could never never get married never found the right girl but he found her at my wedding it was amazing you know he just oh, he cool. found her when he was at my wedding so generous he is a great great friend and it was the first time i ever went into a cue car for real. And it was the E500 of my God, what a car. And that's him all over. He looks like Clark Kent, unbelievably handsome, <laughs> thick glasses. But only when he takes them off, you realize he is a kind of Superman. So a Q car for a Q man. No. Nice. Okay. And this is, seems a really good way to segue into Edward Lovett, who is not a Q man and doesn't look like Clark Gable, but he does look like Tintin. <laughs> You're being very aggressive today. You're sat next to me. I could punch you. <laughs> But I'm not. Over to you, Hergé's Adventures of the Q Car. Fine. So Volkswagen hmm. did something. Oh yeah. Several years ago, Where's where the, they where is in, this going? You're not talking about the third no, Reich. No, 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 they didn't. No, and they they at the same time, whilst they engin engineered the most powerful car, the Veyron, at the opposite end of the spectrum, they engineered the most efficient car being the VW XL1. And mm. I think they had always told the story that, you know, it was, uh, you know, a huge loss making exercise to do that. And Pierre had demanded they do it. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But, but I just think the fact they're so contrasting yeah, is, yeah. Is, is a wonderful thing. We can do both. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously making two cars that don't make any financial sense wasn't enough. So they obviously had to throw in a third. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and that third car was the VW Phaeton W12. Oh yes, yeah. Which you know, I haven't driven one. I don't think I've even. Well, I have. I have driven a W12 engine, but I think that's a pretty cool Q car. Very cool. Yeah. And, and it was. It is a rare old beast. They go very fast. Yeah. And also, they 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 define how you say it defines whether you live in the home counties or not. Because we say Phaeton, but they say Phaeton. Fight. Yeah. Have you been in a fight? Yeah. You've never well, find okay, one. Write that down. Yeah. yeah. But uh, as Chris obviously gave three, I want to give about 10 as well. But no, I'm not. I'm going to behave. You've written down Edward, the load. Edward, no, no, you, um, I, know, I know, you know, be careful about mentioning this name, but I, I have to say that was one of the best Clarkson columns, um, Jeremy Clarkson columns I've ever read, because he said that um, he was invited out to the Middle East and they uh, de-chipped the car. And the idea was it was going to go as quickly as possible in a straight line. And there was some three kilometer road. And he said that um, he got into the car. And I think um, it was either Pitch or Pitcher Schrider was in the passenger seat waiting for him. And he said he turned the ignition key and nothing happened. And he looked at him and he said, well, this isn't a very good start, is it? And he turned around and said to Clarkson, uh, I think you'll find it's already running. <laughs> it was so <laughs> smooth. It yeah. was such a great opening plan. I think it did 202 miles an hour on that straight, 199, 200, some absolute insane number. Yeah. They are they're they're that engine is fast. It's basically a Bentley, isn't it? With a with yeah. a VW badge on it. That's Can we go back said. to Heroes? Clarkson's one of mine. 
Well, here we go. Here we go. He's actually one, he's actually one of mine. And he wouldn't speak to me, but of course he's one of my heroes because he's the greatest most journalist that ever lived. So I'm happy to say that. I'm happy to be second. Um, right, here we go. I reckon um, there's something about Q that I love. Uh, like for all the reasons you've explained. So I try, and I knew that I'd have to go last on this and everyone would have explained everything already. But there's a lovely story about um, a combination of how, well, but how Q uh, in, in the military sense came to meet Q in a motoring sense. And it's to do with the British army on the border between uh, West and East Germany before the wall came down. Uh, and as a British motor journalist called Mike Duff, who's obsessed with mm -hmm. this, and he told me about the story. Um, there was a there was a mission called Bricks Miss, right? You know this. This is a really yeah, cool it's a really story. Good story. Uh, so 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 Bricks Miss was the British Commander in Chief's mission to the Soviet forces. I'm reading that because I couldn't remember what the acronym was for. And what would happen was basically so they could get some good intel on what our East German and Rusky friends are up to. They would dart across the border in the middle of night to gather intelligence, speak to civilians, do whatever they were going to do. Uh, and they needed vehicles in which to do this. So they got a load of what were Vauxhall senators, and, and the, they were later senators of 24-valve engines. They made them four-wheel drive, gave them as much power as possible, blacked them out, gave them matte paint. And they were the ultimate undercover vehicles because wow. they were Vauxhall fucking senators. And I think nothing epitomizes Q more than the Bricks Miss cars Ooh. because they were military vehicles in the spirit of Q and they were based on voxels. I just love the idea of this thing, this voxel good out anything. So I've got so many things to say on Q, but I think that's a lovely Q anecdote. For me, Q, like Neil and Chris and Manage Never Just Said, is the epitome of car enthusiasm for me. I love knowing I've got something under my right foot that's going to shock the peacock next to me. That is the greatest feeling, being at those traffic lights and thinking, this person in their brand new RS4 doesn't know that my S4 has been chipped to buggery. And when I put my foot down in a minute, they're going to get smoked. I, I love that feeling, especially if you're a small little angry man like me. It really is. It's just perfection. <laughs> Um, but I think um, I think the, the I think Q has been subverted and changed forever by the electric car, hasn't it? Because ultimately, if you drive, if you if you turn up at the traffic lights and there's someone next to you in a in the latest Fandango that's got 800 horsepower, and you're in a Tesla Plaid, you're going to smoke them, whatever. Well, you're yeah. not going to smoke them. You're going to electron them or whatever you do in an electric car. So I think I think Q might have come to an end because of the electric car. Yeah, and Q and Q isn't being delivered with any style. Perhaps. No. The ultimate recognition of the failure of the electric vehicle to appeal to people like us is they could have rebranded it as the Q car, the ultimate Q car. But, you know, the Taycan Turbo S should be the ultimate Q car. Yeah, but for some reason, it isn't. It, it's yeah, not. It no. Um, so I think uh, I think there's so many Q cars that I could list, like all of you. I, I think we should enjoy them while we can. I know. And I think the other the other thing that is for me is a theory that I absolutely adhere to now. We forget electric cars because they're, they're a bit dull, is that. In the last 10 years, the best Q cars have been what I call the one down from the top. So if you look at a range of cars, if you look at an RS4, that's not a Q car. Everyone knows what that is. But if you come down one, an S4, mm -hmm. now that's a Q car. An E63, everyone knows what that is. An E53, no one's quite sure what that is. If you come the one down, if you go M5 to 550i, the, that, that, the one down from the big daddy is probably the Q car. I'm not sure it was made to be a Q car, but it probably is. Yeah. Mm. I'll say one other theoretical thing that's really important before I bore everyone. Q is as much about the driver as the vehicle. Because if I stick Richard Leitz in a Fiesta 1.1, you'd be amazed at what he can do. Yeah. So maybe Q is in the fingertips of the of the of the machine operator. It's in all of us. Yeah, so you can be Q yourself because you can make a vehicle do something it shouldn't do, which in yeah. itself is. And Cute. we all love that feeling. Yeah, we do. We do. Um, but I, I got enough to have fun. it one day. Sorry, I said I hope to have it one day. Yo, oh, you <laughs> manage. You have it in a filmmaking capacity. You've all got it. It's just fine. It's so, just releasing it. it. We can help. And we I, can help. I, I, th I think before I mention which my what my favourite Q car is, I've got to say that it's not about. It's about. This is not Q ship. But it's 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 not Q tip. Okay, so and, and that should be. Well, someone needs to choose, breathe, and stop as their song after this, don't they? Because a Q tip. Um, I reckon it's the E28 M5. Yeah, I knew you were going to say um, 
Because when it, yeah. Yeah. I've got one, I'm biased because I've got one, but I still look at it and go, the way that looks doesn't square with how fast it is. Yeah. And what it, if you'd been at the Brussels Motor Show in 1985 when they launched it, you could walk past I, it. Yeah. I just don't think you'd have any idea what it was. Yeah. It look, it just looks like a, yeah. a, a load of fairly conventional geometric shapes that happen to have an M1 engine in it. And I think that was the original Q car for me, my generation. But of course, there'd been 6.3s and everything beforehand. What colour is yours, Chris? It is black. Uh, well, it's uh, not it, another it, little aspect of Q cars. You say it's not just one down, it's the colour. No one's going to have a magenta Q car, are they? Or a fluorescent yeah. No, no you're hard. right. You're yeah, right. It's really camouflaged in colour. Yeah. I think maybe we should write the book of Q. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, Q, so, Q can also so, exist in, in shoes. Maybe really? that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think in watches, I think there's the Q analogy can can be in most male items. Maybe. So if we, how about if we talked about the Top Gear cool wall back in the day? Can we have the book of Q? Q what stuff Q stuff we, that meets, something, yeah, stuff, stuff that meets the criteria of Q. Yeah, yeah, yeah good. Um, we should do that. Okay, right. So make make a note of that. Fine. Yeah, Peter Olo probably needs to start another Instagram <laughs> account. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> moving on to uh, some. Canadian GP thoughts. We're, we're, we're getting tight on time here, so we're going to go. We're going to get through this because there's not a huge amount to talk about from that race, from my perspective. Quite a bit to talk about from qualifying, though. Uh, Manish and I have had some spirited exchanges about our views on a particular Spanish driver that drives for the Scuderia. Manish, please publicly put your thoughts forward on Carlos Sainz's um, impeding Pierre, Ga- was it Pierre Gasly, wasn't it, in qualifying? All of them. Yeah. Well, I, I'd like to say I love Gasly, okay? I'd like to say that. I think he's just fantastic, underrated, and when he comes good, he's going to come good in a big way. But all, all I would say is um, he didn't impede just Gasly. I mean, the guy was doing 30 miles an hour going into the last chicane twice, but he was basically in the middle of the road. And I don't think you can do that. And I think when it's raining and you can't see... I really don't think you can do that. Now, Chris pointed out to me that one, I'm not a racing driver. Two, I've only owned one car. Three, I've never actually been on a circuit where both <laughs> my mirrors were utterly fogged up. And four, so I should shut the fuck up. But I would just like to <laughs> Those say, are all good points, Manish. <laughs> <laughs> all fair, but, but all I'd say is I, I think you've got to have a teeny tiny bit of respect for the other drivers. And I, I do get the idea that qualifying is very much a lottery or can be. And in signs of mitigation, I mean, he said he was blocked seven times, but I just thought it was just, it was just so obvious. And it, it, it really was one of those moments where had Gasly not encountered him in that corner, in that moment, I could either see him going into the back of him or, you know, losing traction, going off onto the grass, hitting, you know, just, it was just awful. And I did this twice. And that was the exciting bit of the entire weekend for me having said that as well it was the race was the race and someone's going to tell me about how many brilliant overtaking maneuvers there were and I we're not really we're not it. managed we're not but I'm, but I'm i'm becoming a bit i am becoming a bit dispirited even i am becoming a bit dispirited by this season um, well, we should get adrian newey's view of the race can I think in the room. I think he got his two hundred win, whatever it was. I'm not sure that that would be the right <laughs> thing to do at the moment. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I think because I'd be sitting in the room physically with him, and you lot could be goading via the internet. I, I think it would be unfair on us as he then meet me in the groin I'm afterwards. only jesting. I mean, he and he's outside having a lot more fun in, in a Formula One car that should be the size of a modern Formula yeah, One car. Exactly. Yes. Well, I, I managed to, 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 to first of all, I, I would never say to Manish um, that you've only owned one car and such like. I think, um, <laughs> I think I just have I have a degree of sympathy for the for the people that drive these cars. Yeah. Not because I've not because I've driven one myself, but I think they are. I know what it's like to drive a racing car where I feel I can't see much. In fact, when the hands device first came out and was mandatory, I hated it because yeah, I, I didn't couldn't it, turn though. my head the way I used to, and I suddenly felt like I'd someone had taken away half of my vision. Um, so what they have to deal with, you know, the buried inside these these the the chassis of these cars, I find very difficult. But the point that managed made that I couldn't argue against was. Why didn't everyone else end up in a pickle like science? That is very difficult to argue against. They're all dealing with the same problems, but it sounds like science caused the biggest of the lot. Um, and I, I, as for the race itself, I, I don't understand what's going on at the moment because of the way they run the DRS and the regs. Canada was always a really good race. 
So sometimes we're having circuits that come alive that have been boring, and now we're having racing killed where there used to be great racing. It's very, it's very topsy turvy at the moment. Mm. And for some reason, the mo- the current twenty three Formula One car did not want to deliver any kind of entertainment at yeah. that race. I know we had at the end with with. Lewis chasing down Alonso, but he was never going to get close yeah, to him. All and, you know, it said today that um, Alonso didn't really, in the end, uh, it was a sensor problem. So yeah, um, he really didn't have to, to coast and lift. And, and the, can you imagine if he had been on uh, that sensor had been working? I mean, then we, we, we wouldn't even have had that last bit of 1.4 seconds. Is he going to do it? Drama. So, that, yeah, I, it wasn't great for me. And I, I watched it on the live text because I was I was uh, unable to, to see it because I was on an aeroplane. And I have to say, it reminded me of the good old CFAX days when sometimes you'd be there updating the CFAX page to see what was yeah, going on. Um, it was quite pleasurable on the bit. So the BBC team that does the text updates, congratulations to you, because I really rather enjoyed it. And because it wasn't a great race, I didn't really feel I'd missed out on much. Yeah. Um, any uh, Chris Cooper, you've normally got many thoughts on the Formula well, 1 situation. Um, I mean, just on just a, sort of a footnote on the, the science thing. I mean, the, the reality is we don't know what happened. I mean, there's, sure. there's sure. Clear, they don't have spotters like they would have an Indy car, which is... Maybe they should, but they've got the teams there. So they've got the next best thing, if, if not even a better thing. So the teams will know who's... And you, quite, quite often we hear saying, why didn't you tell me about blah, blah, blah. Um, so who knows whether it was an operational failure. It'd be very easy to assume there'd been another operational or communication failure in the Ferrari team. Um, the things... Because, you know, we're trying to be positive and optimistic and we love the sport and, we, you know, the next race in Austria. Austria, you know, always produces, nearly always produces an interesting race. Fingers crossed for that. Um, a couple things I did take from it. Um, Albon, Alex Albon, drove, even though he said he drove the last 11 million laps looking in his mirror, that did bloody well. And yeah. I actually want to, I thought about this in a week, I meant to say this last week, and I just kind of forgot. When we're talking about our dream two driver garage thing for Ferrari and team manager, I put James Vowles. He's a really interesting character. He, um, the fact that he left Mercedes to go there said something about succession planning to me, at least in Mercedes. Um, but it brought him out of the limelight, uh, into the limelight. And he has been quite interesting in sort of, he, he describes stuff. He says what's been going on, what we've been doing, what's happened, so forth. And that has been quite transparent and there's no frost to it. So um, we all love Williams because we're a generation that we grew up with when Williams started. I remember. The very first 79, Clay Riggs only winning the first Williams F1 race at Silverstone Bridge Grand Prix. So we all love the Williams idea and so forth. So yeah. I have great hopes for James and, and Albon drove bloody well. Um, so that was quite interesting. The other thing I thought was, you might have seen that little incident where Nick De Vries and Magnussen were fighting and De Vries on one of the third or fourth of the little chicanes at the back of the circuit, the side of the circuit. De Vries just outbreak himself and took them both off down the escape route. And I thought the way Magnuson dealt with it was really, because he could have been really, really pissed off and got out and started thumping him and said, Bleh. and anybody who watched uh, Will Power basically punching anybody within punching distance at Road America this weekend, but I thought, actually, that could have happened in Canada. But uh, Magnuson's response was, he said, hey, it's one of those things, racing incident. And he looked at the camera and said, I'm hardly one to talk. And I thought that was really, really generous and honest and human of him. And I loved him in that moment for saying, you know, he'd been so easy for him to say, well, he didn't. And he was really Chris, do you remember? I mean, he does have the other great one liner in Formula One, suck my balls, honey. Yeah. <laughs> to, to to, Hul- to the Hul- and even he and, <laughs> he and Hulkenberg have made up now. I mean, they both yeah. must have thought, hey, we'd never expect to find either or both of us back here after what's happened. So, yeah. So, I, you know, something to take out. And I'm Austria in two weeks. I'm optimistic. Roll on the next one. Uh, Neil, any thoughts? Well, Max is going to win any, every race, isn't he? Every remaining race, yes. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's I think that's a. I, I can't, I can't literally imagine. see anyone winning a race apart from Red Bull. So good on um, Adrian. Go and buy okay. my mark bar. Yeah. <laughs> I think the, what, the, what, the closing observation for me also is that um, obviously, George made a mistake in the race. He doesn't make many mistakes for someone that's not been in the sport that long. But that was quite a big mistake. Uh, wow. And and I, I get the feeling that Lewis is is becoming content for this year's cha- for this championship to outpoint George. 
Yes. Actually, the part I think part of the reason why Lewis looks quite content is he's got a bit of gap between him and George now. Because at the end, end of the day, as a racing driver, you've got to beat your teammate first, haven't you? And he got beaten last year. Um, and George is going to struggle to catch up with Lewis at this rate because he's he's had a few races now where he's been on the back foot. Yeah, um, he had the engine failure in Australia, which which gaps him a bit. Yeah. Um, and he was unlucky. Uh, he made a mistake at Monaco that cost yep. him points. And this one, yeah. So yeah, so far this year, George is. I thought he was amazing last year, and I thought he may had a little bit wobble around Mexico, the US Grand Prix, and then ramped yeah. back up by end of the year was on it. So um, I th- my my sense is he's a very down to earth, decent, likable young man, um, yeah. and he'll get back on it. Edward, did you get to watch it in Chicago? Yeah, I, I did. I did watch it in the end, and and I sort of I I wasn't wanting to hang on, but. I was convinced Lewis was going to get past Alonso where they kept telling him to coast and lift, but he he just, Alonso obviously ignored all the instructions and carried on. Uh, And and, uh, it's just, it's just such a, you know, I don't really have the time to be putting aside to watch every Grand Prix, but I'm making the effort to do it. And you (laughs) sort of hope there's some excitement there in some, in some aspect of the race. And there is, there's, there's very, there's very little apart from a bit of, midfield scrapping there was one of the little tiny optimistic thing i thought was just ferrari did get their tactics right they got their strategy right this race they didn't point. Get the boys in and we were all going oh yeah. you've missed it try position trap but actually they got it right they got yeah, it right. that's true one last um, point for me i i this may you may not appreciate us saying this i think george is the real deal yeah yeah for uh, sure. i think he's super quick he's very very bright he doesn't suffer Maybe he needs a bit more ego, who knows? But I think he is totally the real deal. I thought he was the second best driver last year after Max. Um, so if he's if he's having a wobble, he'll get through it. I think he is the real deal. Yeah, I don't think any of us disagree with that. Um, right, I'm going to move things on a bit, actually. There was a topic we've got that's written down for us. We're going to skip, skip that and have it next week. We're going to go straight to our two-car garage to counter... Mm. Uh, the nonsense that Chris Goodwin came up with about trying to basically um, give hand shandies to rich people so that he can go on fancy track days. He also he changed so it in about the five minutes from so, arriving. Which would probably be exactly what we've done to be here now. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm just going to get rid of some of that Vaseline. And now we're going to read out our two car garages as per the what was described. Shall I read it out? Shall I read R- Reg's missive again? Yeah, we've, got it. we've got it. Have we've you got it. it? You got it, Neil? I think, I think... But, but, but people need to hear it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Shall, shall I praise it? I'll praise it. Okay. It's 250 grand. It comes from Uncle Reg. He won the lottery. He loved you, even though you were a bit of a nerd. And he's saying, go out, have some fun. Two cars, cross country driving. And you've got to have two vehicles. Okay. Two vehicles. Doesn't, doesn't specify what types of vehicles they are. This is open ended, which means Chris Cooper's going to find, he's going to find it hard to cheat or not answer this question because it's very, very loose. Neil Clifford, you spent most of your week in Sicily thinking about this, so give us the answers, please. I did, I did. Uncle Reg was a real man for me, actually, but I won't go into Uncle Reg's background, but he was he was the manager of the Portsmouth Mecca Bingo. Oh, oh he was a dude. Oh, only wore velvet. Fantastic. Oh, I both love eyes. It. I love we, we, it. we need to bring back both eyes. Um, the best car in the real world, for real money that some of us can afford, is a Porsche 993 Turbo. I think it's a fucking fantastic car. It was it was made by Porsche before they discovered EBITDA. So every bolt is six inches long, even though it doesn't need to be. It can only be three inches long. It's built like it will never break. It's maybe the cockroach of sports cars. It's just bloody fantastic. You can drive in every weather. For even a useless driver like me, you feel fixed to the floor you feel grounded it's got a wonderful noise particularly if you put a little sports exhaust on it in fact i did buy one on collecting cars and turquoise green metallic um a particularly good example i think and i think you paid good good example (laughs) it's very spec specific i can never say that word um very yeah it's sort of um very spec um specific specific because there's a lot of silver cars there's a lot of 
ball salt black, which I don't bloody like on any no, port. No, never. No, no one likes ball salt black. Solid black, maybe, but not ball salt. There's a lot of navy blue cars, which are sort of okay. But mm. if you can get something a little bit rare, even Gars Red, frankly, in a 993 is lovely. If you can get it in white is also super cool. So I think a 993 Turbo would do everything. You can go everywhere, any time of day or year or whatever. And then you sort of need a classic. And I've been racking my brains on this because you need a convertible, you need a classic, but you need something that's reliable. It's very tempting to go E-type, Roadster. Um, I've got 100 grand-ish left, maybe 110, but you might get a bit of a flaky one for that. Alpha GTV, Julia, lovely little car for four-cylinder car, lovely. But in the end, I went Mercedes W109 Cabriolet. Manual, very underrated, the manual of all of those cars, even a Pagoda in manual, much better than that shitty automatic thing. You can rev the bollocks off of it if it's all, if it's manual. So, and you can turn up anywhere, turn up in Monaco in a, in that 109 Coupe Cabriolet. You don't need the 3.5. In fact, they're they're not as good as you as you think that V8 thing. 109 Cabriolet, nice silver or blue or even green if you're lucky. Um, those are the only two cars you'd ever need. Thank you, Uncle Reg. Thank you, Uncle Reg. And I and a bit of velvet, maybe a bow tie, just to just to oh. finish it off. Bow ties. Um, let's go to Manish now. Two hundred and fifty grand, uh, and you always answer the question. I'm not the person that's going to follow you. So Uncle Reg, in my case, has got to be sort of Uncle Vijay, hasn't he? Yeah. And I'm, um, <laughs> yeah. and, I'm um, and and you know, I think the reason why he likes me is because I just knew at the age of eleven I wanted to be a chartered accountant. I just took it very, very seriously. Yeah. The only thing he had no idea about me was that that just like Neil, I, I own basically every box of top trumps ever. So um, I've got these little two-dimensional depictions of every single car that I could possibly ever have. And now I'm going to make this money go far because I know how to do that. And um, my convertible, I'm going to spend £175,000 on this baby is going to be a 1961 outside lock E-type Jaguar. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm going to get. And it's going to be gunmetal. And I actually found it with black leather inside. And it's just super restored. And yeah. I'm, going to, I'm going to go on a night drive and arrive at dawn at the Manoir Quatre Saisons. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to have, I'm going to have smoked salmon scrambled eggs a glass of champagne and a pint of iced orange juice just <laughs> like james bond because that's what he does but i'm not going to smoke a moorland cigarette with three gold rings because it would make me cough a lot and i can't inhale because i'm very <laughs> asthmatic i've not heard the phrase i can't inhale since i was 15 <laughs> go on inhale i can't inhale <laughs> The other sad fact about me, I did once try at university with a mathematical friend, a friend who was a mathematician, I had a crack at a bit of a joint. And I swear to God, I got I got probably about one cc of smoke into my lungs. And I had the worst fully blown asthma attack ever. And I'm not even asthmatic. I just cannot inhale. So that was um that was right. And now I've got 75,000 pounds less, minus the cost of the suite that night. The other thing because I am my age, is I do remember watching Grand Prix's in 1978 and absolutely falling in love with um, the JPS Lotus team. And um, so you know what I what I found is I found a 1979 Lotus Esprit S2 World Champion car. Yeah, right. it's, yeah. 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 great yeah, livery. It's like that. Lots of cigarettes. It's got world yeah. champion 1979 all over it and it's black and it's gold and it's yeah. sixty seven thousand pounds and i love it i yeah. absolutely love it and there's a bit more james bond in me there as well so it's indian chartered accountant meets ian fleming yeah. <laughs> love, it. love it um so uh speaking of love it uh you can go next okay um so when we did our last tank of fuel i think i started in sam Ritz. i was meeting neil as he had Right, he was arriving at the hotel from Como, and yeah. I was going to take my AC Cobra down to uh, Ospedaletti to the Biblos restaurant. 
But obviously, I've only got 250 grand because Uncle Reg uh, gave everything else to all of his other relatives. So uh, I can't have the Cobra and I refuse to have a, a copy. So I'm going to buy, inspired by my father, I'm going to buy an ACA Ace Bristol. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Oh. Lovely. Yeah. Which, which is almost as good as a cobra it's light it's wonderful on british b on british b roads you can use all the power it has this sort of fizzy exhaust note um so that's going to be my the the majority of my spend and then obviously we've been told not to be practical so i don't need a another i don't need a coupe or anything like that because the weather doesn't really matter I think, you know, a Catrum would be an obvious choice, but as I think I've said in the past, I don't really fit in a Catrum particularly well. Um, I just don't feel comfortable um, driving one fast, especially on on the B roads if I get it all wrong. So I'm going to go... Nothing. Nothing. Very rude today. He's very rude today. Um, I'm going to go for an aerial nomad. Because oh. um, I, I might oh. want to go a bit off road as well, so uh, I do like driving, an, an, I true. do like an aerial gonad. They yeah. are they are great fun. I yeah. can see myself going up the Marlborough Downs and then deciding to come off the road and go across the Downs, literally. Um, oh. So that that's my uh, that's my two car garage for this week. Uh, I'm going straight now to Chris Cooper, uh, and I have no idea where this will lead. So. I was really struck, Neil, because this is me, actually. I didn't really have an uncle, Reg, or indeed any uncle, really. That's the story of the time. Um, but this this guy is me. This, 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 who's written to is me. I was the most boring, left school without leaving a ripple on the surface. No one ever noticed me. So the bit <laughs> about, for God's sake, forget practicality and logic really, really resonates. And 993 Turbo... I mean, thank God Porsche did discover EBIT Dar, otherwise 993 Turbo might have been the last one. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm kind of with Adrian, Mr. Newey. So I think um, for 18, 80 odd grand of this 250, I think you'd end up with a Shelby Mustang 350 GTR, whatever it was, the last, the, the one, most recent one with a silly, silly engine, silly exhaust. Oh, the flat plane crank one. Yeah. yeah That's I a think, great car. Yeah. That's I think a just, great car. you know, it's just, it's just a hooning, fantastic device. Um, and then, bizarrely, I do fit a catering member. I don't know how you don't fit one, but I do fit one. So I buy... Your snake I get a, hips, Mr. C. Say again? Because your snake-like hips, Mr. That C. That must be what it is. That must be what it is. So I'd get a catering R500 K-series, the Evo one, with 230 yes. horsepower. 30, yeah. I'd get two of them. That's three cars. It's a three car garage. I get no. It's a two car garage. Fucking Must, Shelby terrible. Mustang, Caterham R five hundred Evo. That's two cars. Oh, you just got. You just got two. I just got two of one of them. So two. <laughs> this is what I live with when you race with him. He's like Adrian New. He's a rule bender. It's just so awesome because, because 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 you're going to blow. Because I've been up. a boring. Because I've been a boring bastard. Didn't have any friends. If I had two of those R five hundred, I could take. A friend with me. Oh, you always go for the emotional. And oh, even if, I know. even if I'd have the other one in the garage, and I'd always say, "Who would say who's that car?" And I'd say, "That's Reggie's one." Mm. Oh, oh, bloody hell! <laughs> right, we need to get the therapist called in here. It's unbelievable. Neil Clifford's he's absolutely streaming down down his cheeks. It's terrible. Oh, I didn't go to his funeral. It's one of the things I regret. Actually, I'll come back to that one day. Okay. Um, right. Well, I. I um, <laughs> You've got us all going now, Cooper. It's terrible, this is. Um, so mine, my choices are as follows. Um, I tried to look at the wording of this quite carefully. You said you've got to go for drive, cross-country drive. Mm. That's a really key phrase, and it's something I don't do enough of. I tend to do it on my motorcycle more. And cross-country is actually pertinent to where you live. And I live in the West Country, where the roads aren't big and wide and generous. So there's no point in having a soup car where I live. Because if you try and go cross-country, you'll either hit something coming, something coming the other way, or you just won't enjoy yourself because you'll be nervous. And there is one vehicle that, perversely, and for all the wrong reasons I know, is fantastic cross-country where I live. And that is a, ra- a rally Mark II Escort, where I might have been doing some testing in my particular Escort. So for me, and I want the best Escort, because Reg has left me some money here. He's been generous. 
two fifty, I can go to Viking and get a proper historic escort made. I can get Sherwood to put a BD A or a G or whatever I want in it that's got three hundred and something horsepower, and I've got possibly the best car for having fun up to 120 miles an hour that's ever been built. And when I park it up, I get to look at those X-Pac arches and remind myself of the opening sequences to Minder and all the other stuff that just makes us Magic. Go, life great. So it's a Mark II Escort for me. Uh, and I'll mm-hmm. have an X-Pac as well. It's got a ZF. It's got a four-speed gearbox. Um, and that's, that's quite a bit of money there. It's probably £140,000. It's left me with quite a lot of money. And I also, I've read the words to what Reg bequeathed to me carefully i'm about to upset him because i'm going to bend a particular meaning of a word he says i mustn't be practical what does practicality mean is practicality about space is practicality about convenience because practical in the car sense normally means it's versatile and i think reg here's got his words a bit muddled up yeah and and i think I don't, I'm not worried about versatility because I think you can have a, a vehicle that's versatile, but also impractical. And that vehicle is the V10 M5 Touring because it can take a family of five and it can take a load of luggage. But if you drive it fast, it'll do about 74 miles on a tank of petrol, which yeah. is about as inconvenient as a car comes. Yeah, it does yeah. do so I'm going to yeah. buy a V8 M5 Touring. I'm going to have it rebuilt because I got 120 grand to spend on this bloody thing. <laughs> I'm going to have it rebuilt. I'm going to have I'm going to have a massive. I'm going to have the most ornate gear lever and open gate put into the centre console there, that where it sits up against that dashboard. You're and putting it's, a manual, it's full manual. sequential lever, like a DTM oh, lever. Okay. The 90s, yeah, a full sequential D- lever. Yeah. Well, yeah. So all you won't be able to have the SMG. And it's got. It's basically every gear change is going to be a. <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to have. It's going to have four massive exhausts. Motec's going to get 620 horsepower from it. I love I'm gonna, this. I'm going to have. 120 litre fuel cell put in the boot so it becomes <laughs> impractical and i am going to drive that vehicle and i and i i mean this out of respect to reg i'm going to drive that vehicle like a twat <laughs> <laughs> great. he'd I mean, love you for it he'd love be, you for it they'll be under grand one day those cars oh yeah. well so it's there we go he always knew all brilliant. You had the, he knew you had the inner twat he, he did. Well, I, 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 do you know what, Manish? I've done a good job of not hiding it all my life. <laughs> uh, on that note, from Chris Goodwin, Adrian Newey, Neil Clifford, Manish Pandey, Chris Cooper, Edward Lovett, and myself. Never thought I'd list those names together. <laughs> Everyone, go and speak to your go and speak to the Reg in your life and make sure they speak to you before they give you the money and write you a letter, okay? Yeah. Bye-bye.